Now, that's a serious question. Because one of the things that they would have done is they would have gone to the priest to make an offering. I'm not sure. I didn't have time to really research this in depth to find out what kind of offering it would have been. I suppose if they thought that the shingles was a result of their sin, they would have made a sin offering. But offerings uh, in the Old Testament were made to atone for sin, to atone for wrongdoing, to atone for what was wrong in an individual's life. And so they would have gone perhaps with a lamb, perhaps with a calf, perhaps with something else, to the priest. Now, if they really wanted to be serious about it, the instructions were that they should get the best out of their flock. And they should take that and they should put their hands on it. Now, think of your pet calf, your pet lamb, the best that you have. You're going to put your hand on it as you plunge a knife into it. Knowing that that is the price of your wrongdoing. If you read the passage of Scripture that we read this morning in John, you have to ask the question, what in the world were these two Greek guys coming up to the disciples? Why was that suddenly this inspiration for Jesus, this trigger for Jesus to say, now it is time for the Son of Man to be glorified? And the only answer I can come up with in answering that question is because Jesus was concerned about overcoming that old covenant. That old covenant excluded those Greeks. That old covenant really didn't make much of a way for them to atone for their sin. And Jesus understood that what he was doing was the cure for their ill. Now think about that. These two guys are not noted anywhere else in Scripture. They're not somehow prominent leaders of the church in a later day. They're, they're, they're just passers-by almost who happen to be Gentiles, but they want the cure. And Jesus knows that the only way to provide that cure is for him to become the Lamb. Think of that. Think of that Old Testament image and think of the now New Testament reality of Jesus providing the prescription for our ill. Disease. Disease is a horrible thing. I can tell you shingles is not, not any fun. Right. I, I can tell you that there are many diseases that are not any fun. <coughs> when I went to be diagnosed, that's by the way, you know me, I pretty much diagnosed myself, right? <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I had stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I went and I said, you know, I, I think I've got the shingles. There's been a little bit of stress in my life lately. Could be that. And sure enough, they said, yes, you've got the shingles. I said, well, my real concern is my eye. I've only got one good eye among four in my family. <laughs> and, um, I, I don't want the shingles to go to my eye. And uh, so I said, well, we're concerned for that too. And, 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 and I said, well, how long should this last? They said, oh, this, 
physician's assistant, trying to be helpful, I think, in answering my question, said, well, you know, it could be two weeks, could be a month, could be two months. I've even seen it go to be, to become encephalitis. And I had this kind of dazed look on my face, and she started to, she thought maybe I couldn't understand what encephalitis was, and so she started to explain that to me. And I said, you don't have to explain encephalitis to me. I had it when I was two months old. That explains the brain damage. Um, <laughs> But I mean, you know, it was horrifying, the prospect. I needed the cure. That was all I was there for. <coughs> if, if I knew I had the disease, I knew I had a problem, I just wanted to be cured. <coughs> Professional golfer Paul Ozinger was diagnosed with cancer at age 33. He had just won a PGA Championship and had 10 tournament victories to his credit. He wrote, a genuine feeling of fear came over me. I could die from cancer. And then another reality hit me harder. I'm going to die eventually anyway, whether from cancer or something else. It's just a question of when. Everything I had accomplished in golf became meaningless to me. All I wanted to do was live. Then he remembered something that Larry Moody, who teaches a Bible study on the tour, had said to him. Zinger, we're not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We're in the land of the dying trying to get to the land of the living. Golfer Paul Rosinger recovered from chemotherapy and returned to the PGA Tour. He's done pretty well. But the bout with cancer deepened his perspective. He wrote, I've made a lot of money since I've been on the tour and I've won a lot of tournaments. But that happiness is always temporary. The only way you will ever have true contentment is in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that nothing ever bothers me and that I don't have any problems, but I feel like I found the answer to the six-foot hole. <coughs> Disease requires, requires, that's an interesting word. When something is required, it means that it insists. It's compelling. It is unavoidable. If we have a disease, it requires something. It requires either death or it requires something beyond death. One writer says, those people who pray know what most around them either don't know or choose to ignore. Centering life in the insatiable demands of the ego is the sure path to doom. They know that life confined to the self is a prison, a joy-killing, neurosis-producing, disease-fomenting prison. Think of that whenever you think of Kairos. We're all whether we're incarcerated legally or not. At some point in an, or another in our lives, imprisoned, imprisoned by ourselves, imprisoned by our own egos, imprisoned by our own knowledge that we really are not sufficient within ourselves. What does David say in the song? I know I'm a sinner. I know that I don't deserve mercy. Lord, please create in me a clean heart. Renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Restore to me the 
joy of my salvation. What are our lives going to mean? If, if we're carrying around this illness, if we are all sinners, if we are all bound up within ourselves, if we are all needing atonement, in the movie Emperor's Club, Kevin Kline portrays an instructor of Western civilization in a prestigious private school. It's the first day of class. And about 30 high school boys, dressed in matching red jackets, settle into a room adorned with maps, bust of Caesar, Plato, Socrates. The professor asks one student to read a plaque above the door. The student is clearly nervous as he leaves his seat and walks to the door. The plaque itself appears to be an ancient artifact. The student delivers an uncertain reading of an inscription that makes little sense to him. I am Shutruk Nahumte, king of Ashton and Susa, sovereign of the land of Elam. By the command of Ishuniak, I destroyed Sippar, took the steel of Nira Sin and brought it back to Elam, where I erected it as an offering to my god, Ishunia. Shutruk Nahum, Nahunte, 1158 BC. The teacher then asked the class, is anyone familiar with this fellow? Texts are permissible, but you won't find it there. Shutruk Nahunte, king, sovereign of Elam, destroyer of Sippar. But behold, his accomplishments cannot be found in any history book. Why? Because great ambition and conquest without contribution are without significance. All Kevin Klein's character is really saying is most of us, even those who climb to great heights, Climb those heights only to find we have leaned our ladder against the wrong wall. We have lived our lives pursuing gain. And when we have gained all that this world can give us to gain, what have we truly gained? If we have not gained love, and if we have not gained a cure to the ill of our selfishness, we have not gained much at all. Jesus tells his disciples on the occasion of two Greeks wandering into the crowd, it's time for me to die. Why? Because unless a seed of grain falls into the earth, dies, it remains by itself alone. But if a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it is reborn and multiplies and brings new life. Our disease requires a cure. And the cure for our disease involves a death. The cure for our disease involves Jesus' death, and through Jesus' death, perhaps, if we are wise, our own. In February of 1941, Father Maximilian Colby was arrested by the Gestapo. He was a Polish monk who founded a Franciscan order near Warsaw called the Knights of the Immaculate. Eventually he was assigned to Barracks 14 where he continued to minister to his fellow prisoners. He would nod his understanding as men poured out their hearts. Then he would raise his emaciated arm and make the sign of the cross in the foul air of the packed barracks. The cross, he thought. Christ's cross has triumphed over its enemies in every age. I believe in the end, even in the darkest days of Poland, the cross will triumph over the swastika. I pray that I can be faithful to that end. Then one night a man 
and escaped from Barracks 14. The next morning, there was tension in the ranks of phantom thin prisoners lined up for roll call in the square. After